Hey everyone, welcome back to the Black Mental Wellness Lounge. Um, it's been a while. Um, I know it's it's been quite some time that we've been able to get back here, but a whole bunch of stuff happening in life. Some good, some good stuff, some busy stuff, some wild stuff. But we're definitely back, um, and I'm excited to um, kick off these conversations. And first and foremost, I know it's been a wild couple of weeks just in terms of you know the country and all sorts of things happening i'm going to address some of that more so in some future videos but i hope everyone is staying well hope everybody's staying safe um and i hope everyone is taking care of themselves and taking time to rest and to break and to recover and so um i still have not done anything to this background. This picture I randomly threw up here right now. I promise you I'm gonna get some stuff from my background. It's gonna happen. Um, I wanted to mention third week in September last year, um, we created a entire week on Black Youth Suicide where we shared a bunch of infographics, five specific infographics that we shared across our social media sites on this topic. We're gonna be doing a Black Youth Suicide Prevention Week again in September, September Suicide Prevention Month. Just mark your calendars now. We're going to be doing infographics. I'm going to have guests specifically to talk about that topic. Really, really um, excited to do that again. So I definitely want you all to stay tuned uh, with that. And so today, so today is really kind of a mix of our Black Mental Wellness Lounge stuff and also our Future Black Voices. A segment. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Future Black Voices segment, what we do is, is that we try to empower young Black people who are interested in the subject areas of public health, social work, and mental health to get information on things that may help them through their career, things to think about, things to get um, engaged with. And so today, so if you, you know, been following me for a while, um, I have a credential called the M Chess. So as you see it, it's right there. So that credential I got um, a little bit ago, I think it was the end of 2020 is when um, I, I passed the exam. But essentially this, uh, it stands for uh, a master certified health education specialist. And so it is uh, really a widely regarded, regarded public health uh, credential that is, um, you know, is earned through the National Commission on Health Education uh, Credentialing. And so as a part of National Commission on uh, Health Education Credentialing. And so this really is for individuals who really want to get into and who are involved in uh, health education. So if you have a degree in health education or in some form of public health where you took uh, health education courses, and you're eligible through a review process. Uh, the um, commission really looks at your courses and to see if you're eligible to sit for the exam. And then you take an actual physical exam um, to, to be able to get this credential. And so there are eight areas of responsibility for um, you know, being able to get a master certified health education specialist credential or a certified health education specialist credential. And so those areas are um, assessment of need and capacity, planning, implementation, evaluation and research, advocacy, communication, leadership and management, and ethics and professionalism. So these are the areas that you would be tested on. You sit for this exam and it really shows um, those who are, are hiring, those in the public health field, that you understand health promotion, health education, um, program planning, evaluation, so many different um, aspects of this. And so since not a lot of people um, have heard of it, and I get a lot of questions about it, I wanted to spend some time, um, you know, talking about this uh, today. And so I have a special guest with me today. My friend uh, Shayla Anderson is here, who is also M. Chez, as you can can see uh, in her lovely title there. But um, so we're gonna have a conversation today and talk about 
our journeys with this credential, what it means for us, what it's done for our field, and um, to really kind of get some, you know, FAQs out there for folk who are like, this sounds like what I want to do. This sounds like something that would be beneficial to me. And so, Shayla, welcome to the lounge. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Cool, cool. How's everything going? You good? Things are going well. It's so good to be here to see your bright, shining face and to talk about the MCHES credential and all things mental health wellness. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, let's take some time to get to know you. Introduce yourself uh, to the lounge. So what do you want to know, Brandon? So <laughs> let's see. Uh, we definitely need to know where you're from. Um, if you're comfortable giving that out, we want to know uh, where you're from, you know, kind of what, you know, what does Shayla like to do? What are your, your interests? What are your professional interests as well? Um, anything about your career path that you want to share with us will be good um, as well. And then random question, um, and I didn't even prep you for this, but random question, if you had a superpower, what would it be? So let's, okay, you let's have to go. remind me that one, okay? I'm I will. I'll it. do the Don't other stuff it. and I'll jump right in. <laughs> Don't forget that one. Yeah, so Shayla Anderson, um, as Brandon shared, um, I am by nature a Virginia girl. I'm born and raised in Virginia. Um, obviously, I've traveled, went to undergrad in Virginia, Longwood University, yay, Lancers. Um, and I studied uh, community health education there. Um, I went to graduate school at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, go Salukis for all of those of you who are Salukis out there or looking to be one. Um, and, you know, my career um, has taken me um, across the United States. Um, it's taken me um, outside of the United States. And um, I've enjoyed and had a very rewarding career um, as a health educator and working in the public health field. Um, in terms of me personally, um, I'm someone who enjoys life adventure, but I'm definitely all about relaxing. I try to have balance, work hard, play hard. That's definitely one of my philosophies. Um, I am very passionate um, about helping others, um, but I also believe that in order to help others, you have to take care of what I call home. Mm -hmm. um, but that also includes self. Home can include your actual physical home, but home can also include your physical you know, human self, your mental health well-being, your physical well-being, um, spiritual well-being, all of those things. So that's most important and first. And then for me, when I think about it in that context, that is mental health at its most basic. Um, I definitely would share that um, I feel like my upbringing definitely has influenced um, not only my career path, but my interests and the things that I enjoy doing even today, both personally and professionally. Um, I feel like my grandparents, you know, in African American culture um, and, and many other cultures of color, um, our ancestors, our grandparents have such a huge impact and influence in our mm -hmm. lives. And um, I was very blessed to have grandparents and great grandparents um, who contributed to that. Um, and so um, I'll also share a little bit about my early life in terms of kind of on the way to being a professional. Yeah. So, and I don't know if Brandon knows this or not, but I started off very young, um, wanting to help my community and people that I saw who experienced different health challenges and things like that. Um, as you know, in our community, we see high rates of heart disease diabetes and different things like that. And one of the things that intrigued me as a young, um, even kid was, you know, people are sick, like, you know, there's hospitals to treat them, but like, what could I do to help? And because you feel helpless sometimes, even as a young person about helping your family, um, your community, et cetera. And so I basically, um, you know, tried to find ways that I could be involved in helping. And I know I liked healthcare and medicine, um, I think my experience growing up as a child who suffered with asthma and allergies mm -hmm. and being in hospitals and the doctor's offices, you know, it really intrigued me. Uh, and so for me, I made the decision to look at health and science-based, you know, interest careers. My mom 
always had me in programs for health <laughs> and science and all of that. And so I got exposed to all kinds of different things very young, like middle school, high school, um, even I think maybe even elementary school, there were some things that I were able to, was able to access um, because of the extracurricular programming that I was able to be a part of. Um, and so um, one of the things that piqued my interest was a colleague of mine in high school was volunteering at our local rescue squad. And mm. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I was like, really? Like, we can do that? Like, kids? You know? Like, right. And I think I'm going to check that out. And I did. And about, I would say, a month, I don't know if it was quite a month, but around a month before I turned 16, um, I've started volunteering in my local rescue squad. They wouldn't let me on the ambulance. I couldn't be on the ambulance for insurance purposes. Um, but I basically um, did dispatching, which wasn't what you know is traditional. It was logging information in a log book. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I turned 16, I was able to get on board and ride after being CPR certified, et cetera, right? That's awesome. And so um, I was a little attendant for about a year. And then at 17, I was able to, uh, or um, a month after turning 17, I would say, I tested out as an emergency medical technician and became certified. Couldn't legally take care of my patients or anything like that because I was a minor, um, but definitely trained for a year, which is not typical. You get about 30 at the time, 30 something hours of training and you're on the street after your core curriculum. And so that was the early days of my, I would say, the shaping of me going into health education, public health, pursuing a health-based career. Um, and that experience shaped, I feel like, my entire life and professional career. Yeah. Not only did it do that, but it opened so many doors for me. Yeah, that's, that's dope, right? Like, that's a cool thing to get connected to, um, you know, so early and Listen, our our parents are, you know, always about that. Like, you know, you got to be doing something, right? You got to get <laughs> get engaged, you know. Well, I'll say engaged. there wasn't pressure, but there wasn't pressure. But in terms of when I was young, you know, you you don't need to be idle kind of thing. Yeah. Um, was, you know, that was definitely making sure I was challenged in the summers, you know, when school was out kind of thing. You know, I had uh, family members who were educators you know, aunts, grandparents that were in the education field. And so it wasn't a pressure to necessarily like, you've got to study, 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 study. But it was like, there's a book, you know, even my mother had this saying when she'd be like, I'd ask a question and be like, you can look that up. And it's like, <laughs> but I just want you to tell me. So right. I think that started probably this early being resourcefulness, like you need to figure out how to be resourceful, right? right. Um, I'll never forget, and you guys, I don't know if you remember any of this, if you had grandparents back in the day and they had the encyclopedias, the I whole like wall that. of two rows or three rows of <laughs> like volumes of encyclopedias. And that I found very intriguing. I liked history and different things like that. So that whole act as a resource, find resource information and the health education yeah. responsibilities. I feel like that probably got started as early as then as a young child, um, when I was directed to be resourceful, basically. Right. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, and so, so you, like you had, you had this interest, right? So like you had this like early peak, this thing that I, I kind of really started to like move you into where you wanted to go. And so, you know, so you talked about your degrees and so, you know, undergrad, oh, first I was supposed to say, um, my mom and my mother's side of the family is from Virginia, um, hey. Suffolk and Lawrenceville. So we got oh, some- Southeast. <laughs> yeah, we got some yeah, Virginia yeah. connection. Oh, uh, there as well. But so like you're, so you're going through this, like you're going through this in like your teenage years, right? So like you're getting exposed to like so much cool stuff that some people don't even, you know, can't even dream about, right? And so like you're doing this, it's piquing your interest. You already have this sense of like, you know, being resourceful, finding this stuff. You go through undergrad, um, you know, go work on your master's. And so at some point you're like, you hear about this credential, 
right? And you want you want to go into it. So like, where was that point? Like, what made you like want to pursue um, getting the MCHES uh, credential? So um, I studied, as I said, um, health education as an undergrad, and um, that was always put in front of. I feel like our um, my my peers in the program by um, one of my undergraduate professors, Dr. Kosarjan um, at Longwood University. And basically, you know, it was like, this was something you need to consider doing. It, it wasn't so much like we were mandated. It wasn't a program requirement at that time, but it was put before us as this establishes you and kind of cements you as a health education professional. Um, it would help you in terms of your career progression and advancement. And um, so it was kind of put in front of us early in my health education program. Um, and it was always kind of in the back of my head um, in terms of being credentialed. But for me, obviously you have to get through the program and get so many credits and things like that. Um, I finished you know, my undergraduate program and I thought, I feel like I should study more, you know, before I sit for the exam because I'm I want to pass the first time kind of thing. <laughs> and um, basically I did. I decided to wait. There was definitely encouragement to go ahead and sit for the exam. Um, I decided to wait. I had applied to grad school. I got into Southern Illinois. And I will say after my first semester, um, I think it was something like foundations of health education prevent. Pre principals, Dr. Roberta Ogletree's class. And I said, if I'm not ready for it now, I'm, you know, like, I'm never going to be ready for it. Because that was one of the best classes I think I've had in terms of the foundational principles of health education. It almost, I feel like, encompassed, um, you know, that 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 time I spent even in undergrad in terms of reinforcing what I learned and really making me feel even more comfortable. And so um, basically, it was time, right? It was time to go ahead and sit for the exam. And um, I did, um, I sat for the exam um, and I thought it was important to do that um, and went forward. I knew that it aligned with my career path, the degree of study, what I would be doing, you know, as a professional. Um, and so in terms of the M chess, um, you know, I've, I was a chess for quite a bit, quite a few years and, um, you know, could have taken the MCHES quite a long time ago. But, you know, life happens like you like you shared right. earlier. Life happens. And, you know, between, you know, <clears throat> schooling, personal life, family, um, you know, professional working domestic and abroad and some of the things that I've done in my career have have really been busy. And when you want to sit for something like that even at that next level of MCHES, you want to make sure you're prepared for it, um, mm -hmm. that you're in the headspace to be able to go ahead and take that exam, do well at it, and just kind of cement yourself as that professional. And so I delayed the MCHES for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then it came to a point where it was like, okay, Shayla, you're out here. Um, you're doing it in the profession. You know, you are successful at your job. Um, you know, you are mentoring, leading, leading interns, mm -hmm. um, coordinating internship opportunities for emerging professionals, training peers on, you know, which used to be the seven, now eight responsibilities um, of health education. Right. Go ahead and submit yourself as the master health education specialist <laughs> that you are, right? Um, and so I support um, and just like the first time with the, the chess, I sat for the M chess and passed the first time. And so um, now, Ooh. you know, the rest is history. No, I, I I love it. Like that's that's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, mine took a while also. So like I wanted to sit for the chess initially, and so when I went to submit for it, I didn't have enough credits. Mm -hmm. I was like this close, but I didn't have enough, and so um, I ended up. And this is something I don't know if I've even mentioned this on the lounge before. But for a little bit, a little bit, I did pursue my doctorate at the great illustrious Morgan State University where I got my undergrad degree for. So I was going for my uh, DRPH. And, you know, shortly after I was there, like my daughter was born, there was so much happening that I was like, this is, isn't for me. But it gave me enough credits <laughs> to go ahead um, and, and sit for this. And so it was really, um, you know, again, like you said, like you just want to get to that point where you're like, 
<clears throat> with all the things because you know and we should i should mention this difference also with the ches and the mches is that the mches requires i believe it's five years of actually like working within the field like doing things in the field of health education or so re requires that also and you have to submit your resume and things like that and so you know with that that point like you know like you said like you're doing this stuff you're you know in the in the field making this change and you're like let me get this thing to like get me there as well so i definitely appreciate um you know you you showing us what that that journey is like in that there's not a perfect time it's there's perfect no for you yes. what your perfect timing is you know the biggest thing um for me is you know the window it happened when it needed to happen for me um that didn't change what i knew what i know um my competency in terms of the profession and what i'm able to deliver as a professional um but it just it go ahead and it cements you um in 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 saying officially that look i am a master at this um and i think after um, a about 14 year career in public health ed health education. I think I think I should be able to say that at that point. And so that was a motivating factor um, in terms. And, and then the other thing that um, I think is important is I think in career and as emerging, I'm calling everyone emerging professionals because my <laughs> everybody might not be young, you know, um, we're all young in our minds, right? right. Um, but as emerging professionals, um, I always encourage my mentees to diversify their professional portfolios. And so mm -hmm. when I say diversify, what are things can give, that can give you that edge over the next candidate um, or things that you like? I'm not saying go and go for something that that is not an interest of yours or something that you don't desire to do. But for mm -hmm. me, my career path has been built with experiences that things that I actually enjoy doing. And of course, everything you do in your jobs, you're not going to enjoy. Let's just be transparent. But they should be things that you have an interest doing. And when it comes to diversifying your professional portfolio, what are those things that give you that edge that you also enjoy doing? And so sitting for this exam gives me a, a ability to diversify myself the way the person next to me may or may not. Um, and gives me yeah. an edge when it comes to qualifying for job experiences, internships, maybe, you know, when you're talking about going to the graduate level and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great ed advice. Like, you know, again, like just getting connected to, I think there's two things that you said that I really wanted to hone in on. So like the first one was, you know, setting yourself apart, right? With things that you like doing, sometimes we want to, you know, have like this amazing resume, especially when we're, when you're younger. And again, for those of you who are like in college, early professionals, like, you know, what Shayla said was really key because sometimes you're just like, I'm going to do er any and everything just to be able to plug it in, whether or not I hate it, whether or not I ever think any of those skills are transferable, you know, I'm going to do it. But being strategic in how you put together your opportunities, like it makes a difference, right? So like being thoughtful in that, and the second thing, and this is a shameless plug for a future video that I'm going to do, but <laughs> like the idea around like confidence, right? Like you, you were able to say like, with the things that I'm doing in my career and the things that I've been able to do, things that I've been blessed enough to do, I'm in this position to do this work. Like, you know, I know I'm a leader in the field. Like I know that I'm able to, you know, to lead and do things like that. <clears throat> there's enough, and I've done a video on imposter syndrome before, but there's enough imposter syndrome out there already. Like, you know, have the confidence, like feel, you know, good about yourself and the things that you're doing. And, you know, talk to yourself in that way. Like that positive self-talk is really, is really key. So like, I always like try to tell people like there's, nothing wrong with confidence and trust and faith in your abilities like there's nothing wrong with that if you manage it well but you know that can be the difference of just like you know if you're like uh i don't know if i'm good enough i don't know if i'll pass i don't know if i'll get through this exam versus i know what i know even regardless of whether or not i pass this and get this credential either way i, I know what i'm doing in the field and i'm confident in the things that i'm doing so that those were 
amazing points. Yeah. And I mean, I set a standard for myself, but the reality is, you know, we're not perfect. I didn't score 100 on the exam. I'm being yeah. full transparent. Um, but at the same time, even if you don't pass the first time, don't quit. You know, if you know it's something, this is the field in which you want to study and work and or work. Um, if this is what you want to do with your life, um, if you want the credential and you are going to honor um, those responsibilities, because I believe in that too. It's not just about signing up for something just to have a credential behind your name. Mm -hmm. um, I will say Dr. Sargent was one of those people. She was a stickler about you know, when we were talking about the seven responsibilities, about knowing those responsibilities and what it means to be a health education professional and honoring mm -hmm. that and building a career around that, but then also thinking about the people that have to come behind you. And so it's OK if you make a mistake. It's OK if you don't feel as confident. But what is it that you need to do? Um, what is the plan that you have mm -hmm. to get to you to where you want to be? And so and I'll talk a little bit later about, you know, studying and all that kind of stuff at the exam. But um, what are the steps that you can take? One of the things I've worked with young people in the past, like do goal sheets, like bite off yeah. things in small chunks. Like don't just sit there with a the big book. And I had it on my desk the other day because I was looking for something. But that big old study guide, don't sit there with a <laughs> the big old study guide and try to just chunk that through in a couple of weeks right. or something like that. Start biting off of it, taking trainings, you know, um, doing things like this um, mental health collective um, experience and places where you can be in yeah. rooms to learn. There are documentaries and different things that link public health and health education threads, things that may be more enjoyable or palatable for you so you can build your knowledge in ways that we don't traditionally think about. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to that in a bit. <laughs> oh, in the advice section, I'm going to get to that in a bit. But perfect segue, studying, preparing for this, this exam. And so um, I can't even remember how many questions there was. I think it was a hundred, but so uh, you know, the test, the questions that they're testing. Yes. And yes. I feel like this time that I took the MCHES was the first time I think I knew which questions were the test questions. And I don't know <laughs> if that's some, cause I've been experienced in the field or if that's just yeah. like, I got some, you know, some of them are like, okay, this feels like a test question or I don't know. Right. But, um, I felt like I had a little insight to that just from <laughs> I saw a question and thought, this has got to be a, a, te a question they're gotta testing. Right. Right. This has got to be one of those questions, right? Right. So, like, with that, you know, like, with, you know, like, what, so I know you said um, doing it in chunks, like, not trying to get everything at once, which I totally agree with. Are there any other, like, strategy um you know, ideas that you have in terms of like studying and prepping um, for the actual exam portion? Absolutely. So for me, I would say I did a better job of the study prep for the CHES exam. And mm -hmm. as I shared before, you know, I could have sat for it after undergrad, but I just felt like, oh, I don't know, I think I need some more time. And I mean, you never know going back whether or not it was going to be a successful or not. Um, but I will say I felt good about it going into it after that first semester of graduate school. Um, now, one of the things that I feel really my entire, the group of us who tested at that time for Chess or sat for Chess at that time, we had a study group that we built. And um, we, you know, obviously study independently, but we got together at each other's houses in, um, in the building where our classes were, we would book out space or get space. And we just studied in groups. I mean, the old school flashcards, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, you know, those are the things that help recalling, calling, asking your peer questions. So for me, I think the best strategy is to get, find a partner, find a yeah. partner, um, ideally someone who is in the profession. If you have a mentor, who is willing to study with you, great. Um, if it's a peer who's been through your health education programming or training, mm. um, reach out through networks. You know, there's like your APHAs and there's other health education, SOFIs and all those right. other health education organizations um, and look for other people who are also pursuing 
um, getting their chess certification or in chess certification and see if you can build a study buddy. Um, because I felt like we were very successful um, in, in landing success with the chess, basically. Um, mm. For in chess, it was just me. <laughs> it was me <laughs> studying. And I did look, I will say, this is a gap. I did look for potential study groups and things and I didn't feel like I landed with anything um, successful. And it was also, you know, during a time, things were kind of difficult during that time period. But um, there are information and materials that um, training courses that people might have out there. For me, I just went old school, pulled out my books, um, focus on those things that I know um, that will be included. Um, I did trainings. Like I said, there were some trainings that I did that touched on different areas of responsibility and areas where I felt like, okay, I could use um, more reinforcement in this space. So I'm going to sit for a training. Um, sometimes your career, if you're if you're in the working world, your job may even offer funds for you to take training yeah. courses um, yeah. that would prepare you for those opportunities. So for me, the studying with a partner and then using your resources, um, finding courses, you know, different things like that, that are um, linking, uh, you know, those eight responsibilities. Absolutely. I think that's all um, great advice. So, yeah, I mean, for, for me, the strategy that I use was really I focused on the things that were going to give me the most trouble. Right. Like there's some stuff that I was like, you know, I'm comfortable in these spaces, especially those that I use like pretty consistently at my mm -hmm. nine to five. Like I was like, well, what's the stuff that I don't have to do as much? Like, how can I, you know, figure out that? And that's the stuff that I, I spent um, <clears throat> the amount of time for, but yeah, I think that's, that's all great. If you can find somebody else to bounce ideas of, I think that bounce ideas off of, I think that's And great. another test strategy they put out there for you to pay attention to is how much weight is given to what sections of the exam. Right. That can be an early indicator to you of what should I really focus my time and effort on in addition to what Brandon was sharing of what are the areas I don't feel as strong in and tackle it. That was my approach to the MCHES. It was, um, what, is the, what is the point percentage for certain areas? And then mm -hmm. what are those areas that I feel like I could use more reinforcement? And that's what I targeted um, trying to focus on my studying. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the probably million dollar question that most people want to know um, is... How has this helped you? Like, what has been the benefit um, of of getting your your MCHES and you know really like showcasing your ability to be able to you know function and do things really really well you know in excellence with those eight areas of responsibility. Like, how has that shown up um, in your career? Like, any benefits and things that you can that you can share? Yeah, so um, I feel um, that the CHES and MCHES credential helps to establish us as health, ed health education professionals. Um, it also motivates me to be accountable for those emerging professionals that I'm mentoring and training up in the profession. Um, I will say because of how my undergraduate program was and ensuring that I had a quality academic experience to include the internship, practicum experiences, I feel like it has supported my ability to have a successful and sustainable career. Um, of course, it's a value add to your resume and to the organizations or agencies that are looking to recruit you. Um, you know, personally, some of the biggest projects and responsibilities that I've had in my career were supported by those very health education principles, theories, strategies, frameworks, et cetera. So things like planning development, implementation of funding, um, and policy think tanks that I've worked on, um, which address different funding policy complexities, um, leading county needs assessments. Like mm -hmm. that was my first job out of grad school was to lead um, one of a county's first community health needs assessment. And so what a great way to translate those skills into supporting that directly. 
Um, I've worked as a PIO or public information officer and done risk communication. Um, so knowing how to source information and then assess capacity for the target audience or the community that I serve to receive that information. Like I could go all the way to things like, um, you know, writing uh, press releases, you know, supporting um, grantees and, um, you know, technical assistance efforts, um, advising folks on different things in career, um, messaging both domestically and abroad and understanding your audience. Like all of these things have layered within my career and those basic principles have helped me be successful, you know, and knowing that material, not just being able to take and sit for exam, but actually knowing how to apply that material. You know, I say all the way from the most complex thing, all the way to something as simple as uh, sending a notification that there's a rabid animal, you know, in a community. Right. That's local public health right there, right? Local right. health education, like being able to craft information that is going to help the public protect themselves. Like these are all principles you learn in your um, undergraduate and graduate experiences as a health educator and then becoming a CHES and MCHES just helps to cement that and say, you, you are a professional, you are knowledgeable about these areas and can perform and deliver in these areas. Yeah, I, I think that that, um, that that those are great. And those are some great, um, you know, some great examples that you've put there that you were able to do. I mean, leading the counties needs assessment, like, you know, being the first thing in the underground, like that's major, right? Like, especially at the local level, like those needs assessments inform so much of like where strategies go, where funding goes, what grants to get, like all that stuff really is connected there. And so, you know, definitely, you know, really great to, you know, to see that and, um, you know, to understand that piece um, as well. And so, um, I definitely wanted to, you know, kind of, you know, jump in also and just like make that connection um, with uh, the, the mental health piece. Um, you know, really just to say also that I feel like, so like the, the MCHES, anyway, uh, the MCHES like really being able to set you apart in the mental health space is really, really strong, right? Like that's a really, really good thing to be able to do. So there are, so like I tell people all the time, like um, I'm a hybrid, right? And so like, you know, like doing multiple things, right? So I have my public health space, <clears throat> I have my mental health stuff. So like, you know, undergrad in psych, master's in health science with a mental health concentration, you know, health education, um, certificate from Hopkins, like all that kind of stuff. And so with that, the, you know, I really talk about trying to set yourself apart because I'm not a mental health clinician. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist, um, you know, which people get surprised about because they're like, you're, you know, you're host of the Black Mental Wellness Lounge, so you're not a therapist or a counselor. And so my public health skills and the work that I do within mental health, like through my public health skills, really makes a difference, right? Like I have tons of counselor friends and tons of, of therapist friends and, you know, I can't do their work. Like that's not, that's not me. I mean, I can't and I really can't because I'm not licensed. <laughs> but like, I, you know, can't do that work. That's not where my skill set is. And my skill set is on the broader, like building public health programming doing evaluation of programming, understanding what needs to be a part of certain criteria. And that's, you know, I feel like has set me apart in in this career because I'm not, you know, not being a clinician, you know, a lot of my clinician and counselor friends, you know, need assistance in building programming. Like at a certain point, they're like, you know, yeah, I want to create this program, you know, whether it be for kids or this demographic of adult or something like that. Typically, they'll come to me you know, with my background and things like that of like, how do you build this out? And then our strengths can really merge and we can put together stuff that's that's really dope and really helpful. So I say that for anybody who's like watching this and wanting to know, like, how do you do both, right? Like you're in mental health, but you have this public health credential. Um, having that credential 
really it, you know sets me to be able to say this is how you develop a program that's going that's going to work that's going to be impactful and even to know how if it's if it's impactful you know because oftentimes you're like well evaluation. evaluation right which is one of the areas of responsibility you're like well people come to it it doesn't mean it's impactful it doesn't mean it's, it's you know doing those things and you want to have metrics on that um and so it's really something that I enjoy doing. And so like this has been um, a big part of my journey. So I tell folks and, and young people all the time, like you can do both. Like there's a really good blend of public health and mental health out there that we need. Right. You know, we need somebody who can speak both language, who knows about mental health diagnoses, who's, you know, studied that and, you know, studied issues around, um, you know, mental health and, and access and all these things. And someone who could talk about this is the so these are the social determinants of health that are even blocking people from getting to a therapist, right? Like there there is that that blending of that. And so, you know, I definitely want people to take that, take that part away from it also. So absolutely. If there if there's anyone um, who is interested in or pursuing a career in behavioral and mental health, you know, don't hesitate considering it as an option if you if you feel that you want to lead a career path on the very things that we talked about and that um, align with the responsibilities of a health educator. Um, for me, um, my career wasn't in mental health I either until recently. And this is an area that I felt like I needed to diversify myself in quite, quite honestly, that I needed the experience working in this space um, because there's so many needs that, that should be addressed um, with regard to behavioral health. And just as Brandon shared, um, we are um, very important to have in those spaces um, because in terms of the decision making about what happens, um, you know, we understand community as well. Um, we talked about the mm -hmm. needs assessment piece. We know how to find information about what's happening in communities of need and applying things like social terms of health, culture and linguistic appropriate, appropriate mm -hmm. standards. Um, and just making sure that, you know, there are things that are being provided, but we're understanding how do you actually get it into those communities? How do you right. ensure that it's effective and that it's reaching the populations that you're getting the outcomes that you intend to, to get and that you actually see a change in behavior, which is very difficult. And so having um, Chess and Chess folks at the table, health educators at the table, um, folks that are credentialed and really know their stuff. Um, makes a huge difference in the environment. And Brandon can probably attest to you, we can attest to you, the strides that we've made even in the mental health, behavioral health space. Um, mm -hmm. Even recent years with having folks like us at the table and in these environments and shifting the conversations and focus and making sure we're driving folks to get outcomes for our communities of need. Listen, we can make stuff happen. <laughs> we make it happen. We make it happen. We absolutely make it happen. And that community piece, I'm so glad you mentioned that because we we do like, you know, there's a lot in mental health that is still unfortunately very focused on individuals and on, on what's happening with the individual, their choices and things that are happening with them, their mental health diagnosis. Um, and and kind of looking at those, you know, um in a box, which I will say for my social work people, I know that social work is very good at looking at the whole picture. I got called out from one of my social work friends for making that comment on Twitter. But, you know, like getting us all here, all, to, all together in the room is very dynamic. Like I said, we can, you know, do both of those things. We can engage in even this one, to Shayla's point, knowing how to engage with community there are a lot of folks that jump into the community work that don't have the the, the, the skills and the, the knowledge and things that we do. And it's really hard to get community back to the table after something has gone wrong or if you've offended them or things haven't gone the way that you want. You know, it's a tough thing to do. And so, you know, having us there, we can, you know, talk and engage and figure out you know, how do we make this work and even do community based activities like, you know, having and bringing in community voice, youth voices, whatever, you know, is is really important. And so I'm glad you brought up that community piece. 
Um, last thing um, before, well, two more things, but before I get you out of here, is there any other, you you dropped so much knowledge in this, in this space, like during this time, or is there any, anything else, any other advice, any other things from your experience from, you know, whether it be about the exam, career, early career advice, college advice, like, is there anything else that you want to drop uh, right now for our viewers? Yeah, so with regard to the Chess and MCHES exam, I would say don't hesitate, you know, just go for it, you know, make sure you have all your stuff set up and ready to go because, you know, NCHEC is going to make sure that you are eligible for the specific for the exam that you have, um, the credit hours in the profession, um, you know, or your degree within the profession um, in order to do that. And if it's the MCHES, the number of years requirement professional that you have to have to sit for that exam. Um, and so, you know, don't hesitate if it's something you know that you have an interest in, you know this is in your career path, that you're going to be doing this work. Um, cement yourself, diversify yourself and and go ahead and do it. And, and like I say, I say diversify. This is kind of a thing that I've been sharing with folks, because I think just like we look at from the financial perspective, diversifying portfolios, or if you're at the stage of retirement, for those who might be listening in, who might be looking at a career shift, maybe it's not mm -hmm. that, you know, you're an emerging professional new to career, but new to this career, you know, just like we talk about diversifying portfolios in those contexts, diversify your career as well. This is an opportunity to do that um, if this is an area that you're interested in. Um, again, you know, choosing things that you enjoy doing. I will say that in my career, I've been able to do so many things that I actually enjoy doing. Um, you know, I pursued opportunities and experiences of things that I liked. I liked emergency preparedness. So I had a time when I was able to do that both domestically and abroad, you know, I've done things with infectious disease domestically and abroad, um, you know, general health education, working like with the community, doing basic chronic disease prevention and mm -hmm. um, home visitation type programs and things like that. Like, you know, the community needs assessment piece, like, you know, to be able to do that straight out of graduate school, like that's such yes. a huge career boosting opportunity. But I do believe that um, having the CHESS credential helps open that door for me, um, for sure. So, um, you know, those are things to think about, like, you know, really assess, um, look at, you know, look at yourself in the mirror. Is this something you really want to do? Who are you? Who do you want to be? Um, and, and don't hesitate on it. Um, don't hesitate at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love that advice. Um, yeah. So just, you know, go for it go forward and, and connect and, um, you know, really take some time to, to look it up if you're interested. So the National Commission on Health Education Credentialing, their website is nchec.org. So if you're looking for more information, you want to learn more about um, the exam, when it is, when the schedule is, if you want to order the handbook <coughs> um, from their website, that's nchec.org if you're interested um, in that. But but yeah, bet on yourself. Like, you know, go forward and, and bet on yourself and your skills and, you know, keep that confidence with you. Um, and, you know, this could be something that can, can change your career. Um, so, Shayla, uh, again, um, I appreciate you taking your time um, to really talk about this. And, you know, to really, you know, help pull others up and be a mentor to other folks as well. And so if anyone has any additional questions or want to get in contact um, with us at the Black Mental Wellness Lounge, um, just email me at blackmentalwellnesslounge at gmail.com and um, I'll definitely reach back out. But again, super um, excited to have you on, Shayla. Thank you so much um, for, for being a part of this. Thank you so much. It's been great. Awesome. Awesome. So I'll be back. We'll be back with another episode uh, soon. We have some more coming up. Again, look out for us the third week in September um, for uh, Black Youth Suicide Prevention Week. I'm definitely excited about that. And I promise y'all, not the next video, because I'm not going to get it done that fast. I promise y'all I'm going to do something with this background. All right. Talk to y'all soon.